so listen, I wanted to, uh, I actually wanted to touch on something else going back to the sort of the core issue here of uh, female intersexual competition, because there's actually two kinds of things going on that are often given the same name. And it's probably worth actually distinguishing these things. So on the one hand, uh, we, we've been focusing more on the, um, the, the sort of what, what might be thought of as sort of the classical version of female intersexual where you know woman woman A uh, perceives woman B as a potential uh, rival for the male that woman A is interested in, and so she engages in some kind of derogating, gossiping type behavior to sort of put down uh, woman B in, uh, in, uh, either directly or indirectly in the perspective of, of the of the desired male, let's say. So uh, this is sort of the classic the classic version. But there's something else that goes on that's sometimes called intersexual competition, which is worth uh, keeping in mind. And this is the idea, and probably to uh, to get too far into this, you got to we got to say maybe a few words about uh, about uh, Robert Trivers' um, parental investment theory. Uh, which is the idea that um, because of the different biology of males and females, where females produce these very uh, nutritionally rich uh, uh, eggs and only produce a small number of them, I think like maybe 300 or something across their lifetime, whereas uh, males produce these very inexpensive sperm and have millions of them at any one time, uh, the females tend to be much more protective and, and, and it creates a cascade then through, uh, through uh, pregnancy and uh, birth and nurturing children so that the always from the beginning, females have a much higher investment in the child and therefore have to be more selective about who they're going to mate with. Whereas, so males tend to be uh, oriented towards uh, the quantity of partners uh, where females have to be much more oriented towards the, um, the, uh, the quality of their partner. So once you get this sort of thing playing out, then you get the situation where the males Females kind of have something. So the, there's just thing in terms of numbers, right? In terms of, you know, let's say equal numbers of males and females in the world, because females are only producing like 300 or so eggs in a lifetime, just the total number of eggs in the world among humans is very small compared to the total number of sperm in the world, which is very large. So literally, these eggs are actually a scarce resource. So men want women more, well, how, how would you describe this? I don't want to say they're more, they're more, they're more casual. <laughs> you know, maybe that's it. I don't know, but they don't need, like, they don't need as much commitment. Whereas the, the, the females need more commitment. Dude, I'm trying to talk here. What are you doing? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so as a consequence of, uh, a consequence of all this, the, um, the, 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 the male desire for sex gives the female a, a negotiating chip. So the female wants the male to commit, become a partner and help her look after the children. Wants to, to make the investment that maybe biology doesn't motivate the males to make. So it's a negotiating chip. You can get access to the eggs, which is not, you know, so from the male perspective, it's just getting sex, right? It's getting laid, you know, but from a biological perspective, it's getting access to the eggs. You can do this if you're willing to make the commitment. So it's a negotiating thing. So one of the, one of the theories around intersex, female intersexual competition is that the, um, when, when women perceive other women who are making themselves appear to be more sexually available, they're dressing more provocatively, these women are giving the sign that they might be willing to have sex more easily. And if enough women did that, it would actually kind of lower the price on sex so that if men could get lots of sex without having to make a commitment to get that sex, then the women who are looking to find partners who are going to commit they're going to have a hard time getting these men to make that commitment because they can go somewhere else and get it. So the policing of women who are more sexually available, or at least are perceived to be more sexually available by women, by other women, is a way of maintaining their negotiating position in relationship to men. 
So what do you think about that, Charles? Yeah, I mean, in some of that kind of rings of economics, right? Like you have a limited supply of something, you can, for example, demand a higher price, right? And in this case, like we're not just talking about money, we're talking about men, you know, doing whatever they want, like investing and other stuff and sticking around as a father, potentially. Um, but you, you can think of it from that point of view. Um, there is something I've heard that's related to this. So I, I'm not saying this is true. I'm not saying this is false. I'm just going to mention it, right? Um, and I, I actually didn't dig into this, so I, I don't know how true this, this is. Um, what I heard was that on a number of universities, there are more women than men, right? And what it seems to have done is that it is it's induced a lot of women to behave more sexually than they'd want to, right? Like engaging in more sexual acts of different kinds and more frequently and without commitment than they wanted to. And it seems like there's been some kind of reaction to that by some women. For example, uh, there was there was stuff about, um, I think it was that you had to verbally consent to having intercourse um, you also had to say yes, what was it like every few minutes or something like that? I, I think I remember, like maybe I, I might be remembering it wrong, but, and then times were like, even saying yes, you know, still meant no, uh, you were just a victim or something like that. You didn't realize it or something like that, but it, it kind of seems like that kind of activity, um, like an instance of intrasexual competition, if that's true. Um, that's, that's really interesting. You know, what? I never put those two things together before. Like I was aware of the fact that that women, females are, are beginning to become the majority, and in some cases, quite a large majority on university campuses. Uh, and I was aware, of course, that there's this whole issue around uh, redefining consent and, and making consent really, um, uh, really having to be salient and positive and uh, explicit and so on. Uh, but I never put those two things together. But that makes a lot of sense in terms of what we're talking about. If that's if that's the environment, then uh, tr trying to trying to tap down on the availability of easy non-committal sex for males would be a way of allowing females who are at university to have a better negotiating position in terms of being able to use sex as a negotiating chip to get male commitment that in that context that makes a lot of sense that's an interesting uh, an interesting observation yeah